Hello DMs, I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And have your players ever taken a wrong turn? Yes, well, and that's okay, because you shouldn't be driving anyway. It's improv D It's improv GMing here on WebDM. When it comes to being to, to being a proper GM or DM and, and trying to think about improv, like what is improv GMing and what isn't it? Improv GMing is a is a philosophy of GMing and and a, a broad spectrum of techniques and attitude and and style that says I'm I'm going to let go of my expectations for the outcome of what should happen. I will present a situation, I present a scenario, something, and I want to see how it plays out. I'm I'm more interested in being surprised and and having something unexpected happen, something that emerges from the alchemy of play as opposed to, I, I want this thing to happen, I'm going to use all of these uh, techniques behind the screen to manipulate events to get it to this one place. Maybe the players never realize that at all, and they, they, they never pierce beyond the veil that I've created, mm -hmm. and, and they're none the wiser. It's about letting go of your expectations. It's about uh, at adapting to the choices that the players make, and in order to do that, listening to them. Mm -hmm. And hearing what it is that they have to say, and, and incorporating it into uh, you, you know your own sort of plans for the game, and letting the game grow in organic ways, grow in ways that you might not have expected. Uh, that if, if you're running a, a point A to point B linear style adventure, you don't necessarily have room for the unexpected there. Okay, so to ensure that you can be ready for the unexpected, what should should GMs out there? put in their, 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 their GM toolbox uh -huh. to be ready for that. A big one that I like is asking leading questions. Mm -hmm. um, asking leading questions, not just, hey, what do you want to do, but just what are you going to do about this one thing? A leading question is designed to, first off, it can't be answered yes or no. It requires the player to, to answer more fully, and in the answering of your question, another question will come up. And, mm -hmm. and you do this two or three times as you try to gain a feel for like, what it is that the player wants to do. Yeah, their you, intent, their... You repeat their answer back to them, do I understand you correctly, yes I do, and, and then you maybe present them with courses of action based on what they say. It sounds like what you just said, that these are some of the logical, or, or, or at least to your character, these seem like good courses of action, but uh, again, for me, I, I never want the player to feel like I am limiting what they can do, that I'm prescribing a, a, a set of actions. So I'm always pretty clear to say like, you can do these things, or you can always do something else. In terms of more concrete things that uh, that dungeon masters can do, you know, you, you present a scenario to the players. We don't know what the outcome's gonna be, we just know that we've got NPCs here with goals and resources, we've got players here with their own goals and resources, and we have set them on a course to collide. There's a, a threat of some kind that's imposing itself on, on the players, and, and they need to deal with it if they want to stay here, or you know, whatever it is. They could always leave if they wanted. And so we, those are the kinds of scenarios that we're preparing. Then we need to start, once play begins, and, and once those first few sessions have gone through, and we start to build up consequences for actions, uh, what happens, you know, now that the delicate equilibrium that existed has been shattered by the player characters. So thinking through consequences is, is a big thing. And I spend a lot of time in between sessions thinking like, all right, players did this, what does that mean? What are all the different ways in which my NPCs might respond to that? And out of those options, which one of those seems like the most engaging to, to play in? Sometimes the it seems like, well, an option might be that the NPC, you know, retaliates with overwhelming force <laughs> in an attempt to wipe out the, the party. Uh, sometimes that's okay, but like every time, uh, it, it'll, it'll get old fast. Working through the consequences of what's going on, that requires you to have an idea of what uh, your NPCs want, what resources they have at their disposal. But I find that that way of playing your NPCs mirrors very much the way that players play their characters. As opposed to, to DMs who sort of run their NPCs like, whatever I want to happen, happens. 
Yeah. The, this NBC is uh, has whatever resources they need, wherever they need to be, they are, wherever uh, it needs to happen, happens. And then, you know, we'll roll some dice when it comes to combat, but, but otherwise, this NPC is, is special. It, it doesn't have to conform to the rules that the other... Uh, fictional characters in the world have to and I find that, that that's one way to do it but I like I really like working within the constraints and limitations of the system when I think about my NPCs and so it helps put me in a mindset of like I, I've got goals for this session this NPC this antagonist has these goals for this session as a dungeon master I have these goals for this session and it's now up to me in the course of play to look for opportunities to 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 achieve those goals. And if it doesn't come up, it doesn't come up. You know, example of this again, with Beneath Dark Vows might have been, I, I got three witches, I don't know who they all are yet, but once we, I'm listening to the players, I'm like, ah oh, yeah, of, of course it's gonna be one from Alero's background, yeah. of course it's gonna be one from another player's background, because why not? And now it's sort of like, well, what is exactly they want? I have a vague idea, but I know like for this session, my NPC wants to sow doubt between these two characters. Yeah. They, they recognize that there is a bond between the witch hunter and his sort of chief uh, a, a, a champion or, or apprentice. I want to exploit that. I want to create a division there and, and weaken it. And so I will look for opportunities that show up in the game knowing what my villain can do, knowing where they are in the scene and going like, well, all right, here's the moment where they use mind control or an illusion or some sort of deception to just create a seed of doubt. Yeah. And the next time they'll widen that further and then further. And thinking in those terms of like, what, what can my NPCs get away with? What goals can I, I pursue? And from a DM's perspective, it might be like, I want the party at the end of this session to have XYZ information. Mm -hmm. How can I get that to them? I, you know, I've entered the game with my own priorities, with what I want, keeping the game running forward, moving forward. The players are pursuing their own goals, and we're taking advantage of these opportunities as they arise, as opposed to, I know what's going to happen, I know wh what's at the end, I'm going to sort of steer them along this path or this, you know, web of paths, and, and we'll just, you know, sort of roll dice when it's appropriate. Now it's like, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> like, you know, I, I have an idea of what I want to do. I know where we're at, uh, and I, I know what the consequences for, for the major outcomes might be, but how we get there, what it looks like, what goals we are and are, are not able to accomplish this session, all of that's up in the air. What's on the horizon is yeah. another one. Knowing what, what your NPCs have going on in the background, knowing what threats are going on in the background. I use a spreadsheet for these with sort of columns divided up into what's immediate we're dealing with at this session, mm -hmm. what's kind of approaching but is still a couple of sessions away. It, it's near but not necessarily right there. And yeah. then there's further away and then there's completely dormant uh, elements. This is a, a technique that I learned I think from the saving throw show, the DM for, uh, for that uh, uses it. But I've seen other DMs use it and I, I found for the improv heavy games that I run, it's very valuable because it keeps all of these elements in a, visually in one place and uses proximity uh, to to indicate their importance and and the priority for it, um, but anything you might use to just kind of keep track of everything and, yeah. and something to just like quickly read before a session starts and go okay this is where we picked up this is what I wanted to do that those are other sort of in game and, and immediately pre game techniques that you can use to yeah to help uh, run an improv style game because if you keep all the threads in mind you can stitch something together in the uh, in the end. Yes, I mean that's really what it uh, what it's like. Yeah. And so I, again, coming back to to uh, the Beneath Dark Vows, if you've never watched a, a game over on Encounter RP, they use a, a donation system to you know viewers can influence the game. You'll have uh, you know players who have to roll on a D ten thousand table of effects for what might happen. Uh, yeah. Depending on uh, the the course of the game, there might be viewer decisions. They get to add an element. They get to take a poll and sort of add an element to the game. So there's all these things that are added in that are unexpected for everybody. Yeah. We all have to adapt to them. <laughs> and so it's about creating tools that you will use that, that makes that adaptation easier. Random tables, uh, the use of online RPG resources, 
uh, recycled material that you just never got to. Yeah, all that over prepping from the past. All that over prepping from the past, just you know, use that. And, and then the most crucial one is that player input uh, of listening to the players. Sometimes it's the table talk. Sometimes it's actual feedback. It, it's sitting at the end of a session and going like, you know, I, wow, I thought that battle was was really tough. Uh, how? What did you guys think about it? And this is, again, we're asking pointed, specific, leading questions. There's, it's very easy to go, did you guys have fun? Yep. That's it. That is not mm -hmm. valuable. <laughs> that is not helpful. That You're not going to learn or grow or whatever. So learning how at the end of a session to say, number one, okay, guys, I, I'd like an idea of what you plan to do next. So I, I know where I should focus my efforts. Nothing wrong with saying that. But then also going like, Hey guys, I you know what did y'all think of that interaction with this NPC? You know, I, I wasn't trying to come across as like overbearing, but they are say the, the the count or something. Framing your questions like that, and then asking them a question that that requires more than a yes or no answer is one way to get uh, get feedback from your players. Even then, that they'll say things that you know are like, well, they don't they clearly are not you know they don't want to hurt your feelings or. Maybe they don't know, you know, that they just hadn't had a chance to think about it that much. So there are other things you can do. You can sort of ask them, what do you wish the campaign had more of? That's a way of sort of flipping the script instead of like, hey, what didn't you like? Tell me like what you did like and are looking forward to. You know, some of it is just, you know, having just a conversation with your player, just one on one if you can, like, um, let's talk about um, this part of the game or, or you know, this arc that your character's going through or how you want this character to change. That kind of communication, I think, is, is important. It's difficult, you know, you've got a lot going on. It's difficult to keep up with those, uh, with those conversations. But I think checking in regularly, even if it's not after every session, uh, is a good way to, uh, good way to uh, make sure that feedback's coming in. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on out there. <laughs> oh, the weather's a change and we're going to have to adapt to it because to that's, that's the nature of this show. The confidence comes through the doing of it. And it, it, I, it, I know that there's a lot of pithy little phrases you can hear, fake it till you make it, that kind of bullshit. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it works, sometimes it doesn't. With practice will come confidence. Yeah. And at the same time, you will never not be nervous to some degree. Mm -hmm. Right. Dungeon mastering is an act of sometimes vulnerability because you're pouring your imagination and your heart and your soul into an adventure and sharing it with others. And that leaves the space open for them to go, this is bullshit. Yeah. And that's hard not to take personal because it is time and effort and passion on your own part. So I would say that, number one, learn to live with the nervousness and get it to a point where it's not getting in the way. It's just a... A thing that you go like, yeah, you know, they're back. Well, every week they come back, and so if it was if it was really bad, maybe they w wouldn't. There would have been an intervention <laughs> by someone now. would have said something. Except that the bar, the, the barrier to f a fun time and an engaging time of a session is much lower for the group than it will be for you. You are the dungeon master. You know, you have an idea of how this whole thing is supposed to work. You have an idea of the, your world as it's laid out, the game as it's laid out. You know all the parts to it, all the secrets, all the clues, all the moving bits, everything. You want it to work perfectly. You're way up here with your standard. I don't know where my camera is. Way up here with your standard. The rest of the group is like, are my friends here? Is there dice? Is there rolling? Do I get to do the cool thing that my class says I get to do? Mm -hmm. They're way down here. And so if you can kind of like tell yourself, listen, the point of this game is to just enjoy ourselves while we play. Everybody's enjoyment of it's a little different. It's worth thinking about why you enjoy the game as well as your, why the, your players enjoy the game. But it's not as high stakes as maybe you're, uh, you're putting it. So your confidence will come through doing it as well as listening to your players, soliciting their feedback, asking them direct questions. Mm -hmm. What did you think of X, Y, Z? Not, hey, did you guys have a good time at the session? It's, what did you guys think of that fight? Was that monster too difficult? Did yeah. I, you know, was, was there enough? Was there enough information to make a choice? Uh, as you ask questions like this, as you talk to your players, as you solicit information from them and listen to their feedback, uh, and genuinely take it in, even if it means getting a thick skin and knowing that their criticism of the game is not criticism of you as a person. Hopefully, if it is, fuck those people. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I would have had fun, but you suck. <laughs> right. It's always a bit nerve wracking and, mm -hmm. and you'll just have to get used to it. Now, the second part of learning to let your players uh, take 
control of the game and and work through the problems that you've presented and not offer them outs if something bad happens because you're you feel bad that a, a terrible consequence happened because they didn't catch your trick or figure out your trap or your puzzle or whatever it was. I sometimes, uh, personally, uh, have to just remind myself in the pre-game moments that I am, I am an impartial referee to the game world. I'm my, as, a player, I, I, as a player of the game, a participant in the game, I'm no more special than any other players. I just have different pieces mm -hmm. and a different set of rules. And my job is to present the game as accurately as I can. If something is deadly and I don't present it as deadly, that is harming the game world that we're in. And understanding that negative consequences of the player's actions are something that they are accepting. If they don't know that, if they are not expecting that, then that's something that you, that's a metagame talk you need to have. Mm -hmm. That's a, let's sit down and t talk about the fact that this dungeon is deadly. You will suffer, your characters will suffer lasting and permanent injury if they're not careful. They have character abilities to help them. They have a player behind them to help them survive. <laughs> Asking direct questions of particularly new players or players who are only used to a style of game that is very character sheet focused. I'm gonna look at my character sheet, see what I can do, and not like think outside the box, use their imagination. You might have to, in taking those training wheels off, prompt them with questions. Let them know the consequences of their actions in a metagame sense. And tell them like, hey, this trap right here is really deadly or this monster you're, you're facing right now is really tough. I am playing as impartially as I can. I'm not trying to kill you, but this dragon's a dragon and it might roast you alive. It might eat you. This purple worm might smash you. This acid blast might melt you. This poison will kill you. This thing that is harmful is harmful and you need to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes you just have to accept that a player does something stupid and their character suffers <laughs> and it sucks if it's game breaking for the player then that's an out of player that's an out of character talk that you have with them about uh, you know where to move forward but sometimes you just need to let the dice fall where they may and let the players learn and do better next time yep let the dice tell the story let the dice tell the story head on over to patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Where would you buy the booth? I bought Asper Genesis. It's beautiful. I bought the Cobalt Guide to World Building. And I bought... Uh, uh, the, more, more of uh, even your, more homunculi. Yeah, whispering homunculi, homunculus. whispering homunculus. Yeah, more whispering homunculus, which is just a book of random shit. What's in the one. toilet? Here's a deep, deep but you never, table. You what never, you find you, in the toilet. You never know when you need a table. It's why I like the Dungeon Dozen block, which is like a, it's two hundred some odd tables of D twelve thing. You yeah, know, one of the goblins up top. <laughs> uh, Picking their butt. What's in the toilet? <laughs> What they picked out of their butt. Oh, I bet they have a Is it? Oh, yep. You gonna get it? I meant to look at it this morning. Got the PDF. Dini Beyond, but uh, mm. it's the new Dual uh, Sky Dragon. It's Step pretty cool. Monsters are I mean, Phoenix. I have Clank played Phoenix. Magic a little bit, so I'm not as steeped in the lore. The Guild Pack, yeah, that's really cool. I like cool. tall cities. I love. I mean, it's a cool. I like a city where you can die just walking to work. <laughs> when you have like giant beast like that you things. can ride that's how you get me and then there's dungeon of the mad mage <laughs> wait it's oh it's here yeah that's right what's it doing explore the mega dungeon of under mountain this adventure Ooh. for the world the mega dungeon. i'm so hesitant to even look do i just flip through the map and memorize it <laughs> <laughs> got it oh these are really cool maps. see i like a good black and white map <laughs> Jim, can we get the voice right quick? I can't. <laughs> I, 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 the, that, oh, hi, guys. Those, that voice was a, a, mo a product of its moment in time. Yeah, uh, and, I, and, and, and because of it, I will never forget it. These are both really cool. I'm excited. Nice Look at all of these cool people who worked on this. Ooh. 
Hi guys, what's going on? Hi guys. What are, what are you doing? Here we go. Let's look. Let's look at the credits. Here we go. Here we got Chris Burton. Uh Dan Dillon. We were just talked to Lisa Chen. Matt Clint is one of our editor, uh, mm. editors there. He's a real cool guy. Uh, works with uh, Absolute Tabletop. So there's just like so many cool people that uh, that got to work on this product. That's why I'm really excited about it because it's like. There's a lot of people whose individual stuff that I really enjoy now that they're all collaborating. Uh, How can it not be good? It's a big mega dungeon. Who, you know, sometimes you just need a mega dungeon. You yeah. Pop this down anywhere you need. Anyway, it's curious because it says it's for levels five through twenty. So I want to see what they do for tier four content. Yeah. We really haven't seen a lot of tier four content for fifth edition, and I'm excited to see what those levels look like. You gonna get it? I don't, I don't have my budget's shot. Shot through the heart. Got no 